Well, it's just been so great to be with you uh, in this special series of meetings this weekend, and I thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to be among you. Uh, I want to thank the Strattons and the Smiths for uh, taking us in and uh, providing meals for us in the barns as well, and the Rileys for making us feel home, away from home. Uh, and I want to thank Dell in advance for not taking us for the roasted possum that he threatened to take us for uh, via text uh, earlier this week. Uh, but uh, thank you guys for being here. I, the, uh, we have a number of visitors from other congregations, and I'm personally grateful to, to you for your presence and the encouragement that is to me. Uh, and we may have uh, visitors among us from the local community, and I'd like to just talk to you for a moment because I'm not sure what you're looking for, but if you are looking for a group of people that love God above all things and love one another and are determined to do the Lord's will and follow the scriptures, then I think you've found what you're looking for. I've been a visitor among them the last few days, and that is what I have seen here. And I hope that's what you're looking for, and I hope you will find that here. Well, I'd like for us to conclude our series of lessons really with a lesson that uh, kind of blends and combines and reviews many of the principles and concepts that we've been talking about in this series uh, all together in one lesson and then ap applies it in a particular direction, which is to the home and the family. We've been talking about the fact that the world is not our home. Uh, and... I would just make this observation about, uh, about home and family in our modern world is that the normal way of raising children in our culture is resulting in many young adults who are not thriving in the real world, have extremely high expectations of what the world owes them, and have very low levels of spiritual interest. As Christian parents, we want to raise children who can endure trials while maintaining their faithfulness to God and accomplishing God's purposes in their lives. And we can't do that by following the directions provided to us by the world. What I would suggest is that instead, we need to use the tools God has given us to raise our children God's way. And that in includes raising them as strangers and pilgrims in the world. We're going to examine in this lesson the map that's provided by the history of God's dealings with his children. We'll consider the compass provided by the commands and principles of Scripture, and then we'll explore some ways of applying what we've learned in, to the very real world of trying to raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So let's talk about the map. A map gives us assurance that other people have been where we are before. And it lets us know what to expect when we pass the same way. And in a very real sense, the Bible record of God's dealings with his people functions in that way. And uh, the Bible record reveals what God's people have experienced in their lives. And we find in Scripture that God's children are pilgrims. And this isn't by accident or through the cunning of their enemies that they managed to force God's people to be children, us uh, to be pilgrims. Instead, in many chapters of Bible history, God arranged for his people to live their lives as sojourners and pilgrims. And uh, these things will sound familiar to those who have been for the entire series of lessons, but we'll, let's look at examples. God promised Abraham and his descendants a land that he would give them, but before they received that land, they experienced over 600 years of living as strangers and pilgrims before he brought them into the promised land. As God brought the Israelites from slavery to their inheritance, he led them through the wilderness. They had to stop when he told them to stop and go when he told them to go because they didn't know the way to go. They had to totally depend on him to provide even the basic necessities of water and food, which were often provided miraculously. That necessity of total dependence on the God who brought them there was intended both to test them as well as to build their faith that the Lord would, in fact, provide just as he promised. And we also see in the map of the scripture the history of Jesus, how he left his heavenly home to go 
on pilgrimage for the sake of all humanity, he too experienced deprivation, temptation, and suffering as he subjected his own will to the will of his fathers. And in each of these cases, as we look at the map of the history of God's dealings with his people, we notice that a pattern of God dealing with his children in a way that's very different than most modern parents today. Most parents today consider it to be a high priority to ensure that their children never have to wonder where their next meal is coming from, that they're completely shielded, if possible, from hardship, suffering, and want. Naturally, we want to make sure our kids know what to expect in the days and weeks ahead, and that they're emotionally prepared for any disappointments that can't be avoided. If there's complaining in the household, we may examine ourselves as parents to try to figure out how we can better meet the expectations of our children. In planning the, the family's short, medium, and long-term goals, there may be extensive consultation of the wishes of the children in an effort to leave as few desires unfulfilled as possible. Now, in this environment, the, if we're going to describe the parenting style of God that he exercised with the patriarchs, with the Israelites, and with his beloved son, with whom he said he was well pleased, God's parenting style may seem cruel and unusual. Which leads to this question. How could the God who has everything and needs nothing, and who at the same time has infinite love for his children, allow those same children to undergo suffering, deprivation, and hardship? And even worse, how can he place those beloved children in circumstances where they will inevitably experience suffering, deprivation, and hardship? To be specific, why couldn't God make Abraham a great nation and make his seed a blessing for all nations without 600 years of wandering? Maybe right there in Ur of the counties. Why couldn't God give Canaan to the children of Israel without slavery in Egypt and without hunger and thirst in the wilderness? Or to ask you the same question another way, why couldn't God save all of mankind without Jesus experiencing temptation, suffering, and death? Well, we may not be able to answer the first two questions immediately, but the Bible answer to the third question is found in the book of Hebrews. And those who are here for the Bible class period this morning, this will be a review. Uh, but really, the key to understanding why God's ways are better than man's ways is to understand how God dealt with his only begotten Son. And so read with me Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, beginning. We're told there, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Read also with me Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. Where we read, it was fitting for him, for whom all things, who, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. And Hebrews ten, excuse me, Hebrews chapter two, beginning in verse seventeen, tells us about Jesus. In all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So to answer our question within the about Jesus, why did God subject Jesus to suffering and trials? The Bible answered that question was that Jesus could not be all that God wanted him to be without those experiences. Uh, he was the perfect, sinless Son of God. Uh, but he could not be a high priest unless he became like those that he was going to make atonement for. He could not sacrifice himself for mankind unless he had a human life and a human nature and a human body to sacrifice. And when he agreed to take on that role, he agreed to take on a life of the same life we have, a life of temptation and suffering. Uh, but that was what was necessary to make him perfect in the role of high priest and captain of our salvation. Well, 
God, uh, could, uh, Jesus could not be all that God wanted him to be without these types of experiences. And it was the same for Abraham, uh, and it was the same for the Israelites. And it's the same for us, God's children today, and it is the same for our children. Uh, and so we need to use this map. Uh, that's what the map teaches us. And we must refer to it often to remind ourselves of how God has dealt with his people in the past, how it turned out. It always turned out for the best, didn't it? And so we know what to expect on our journey. But now let's turn our attention to the compass. When we're traveling through unfamiliar territory, a map gives us the lay of the land, and the compass keeps us oriented in the right direction. The compass tells you if we need to make a correction in order to stay on course, and, and our modern GPSs function in, in very much the same way, um, except we don't actually have to know where we are to use the GPS. It tells us what our latest mistake in driving was. Uh, it, they used to say, they don't say this anymore, but mine used to say recalculating, and when it said that, I knew that it did not approve of whatever I had just done. And it, it almost sounds like, the, I don't know what your GPS sound like, but mine sounded like it was kind of hinting that it could do a better job driving. It's kind of like, you know, why don't you just uh, move over and let me drive? It's kind of what my GPS sounded like to me. Maybe I'm just sensitive or something. Anyway, we need that, right? If you're in unfamiliar territory, you need a map and a compass to keep you pointed in the right direction. And and uh, that's what the GPS does. It will say, turn left or turn right uh, in order to stay on course. The commands and principles of Scripture function in the same way. They provide the turn-by-turn -turn guidance to keep us on course as we travel through this world. And uh, we're going to see that our goal is not a specific coordinate on the map uh, or a particular level of economic status in society or security. Our goal is to become what God would have us to be. And that requires time in the wilderness. God does want each of us to become a certain kind of person. Uh, and so he puts us through experiences that build our character. Uh, and we can make this observation. If it was necessary for the divine son Jesus to, quote, be made perfect through suffering, how is it possible that God could make his merely human children what he wants to be without these same experiences? Well, God wants us to be the kind of people who can endure trials while maintaining our faithfulness to Him and accomplishing His purposes. And if we think about it, we want the same thing for our children. We want them to be the kind of people who can endure trials while maintaining their faithfulness to God and accomplishing His purposes in their lives. There's only one problem. It's impossible to raise children who can faithfully endure trials while at the same time preventing them from experiencing any trials. If we think about it, we realize that the wilderness is the right place to develop a character, not the promised land. There is a time and a place for God's children and for our children to have the best of everything, to have all of their needs and wants fulfilled, and to experience no more death, no more crying, no more pain. That time and place is when we reach our permanent home in heaven with our perfected selves. Here on earth, our children need the clear-headed realization that this world is not our home, that we're just passing through. Now, this doesn't mean that we should deprive them of necessary things needlessly to toughen them up or something, but it does mean that we should walk with them through experiences that will keep the spiritual realities of the differences between heaven and earth clearly in their minds. We do that to, by demonstrating to them that it's possible to glory in tribulations. Uh, Paul explains how in Romans chapter 5, verses 3-5, through five, where we read, uh, we, not only that, we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Well, when Jesus was on earth, wandering far from his heavenly home, his Father led him by the Spirit through a special wilderness experience of temptation. 
Uh, at that time, he went through uh, extreme levels of hunger and deprivation. We studied this in our service this morning and also had to face the attacks of Satan. In that hour of trial and testing, Jesus used three scriptures to overcome the attacks of Satan. Uh, he quoted statements made by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, words that Moses had spoken to the children of Israel on the threshold of the promised land, trying to make sure that they kept in mind the lessons they should have learned from their wilderness wanderings. If these scriptures were needful for the children of Israel on their pilgrim journey, and if Jesus made use of them in his time of pilgrimage and temptation, they must certainly be of value to us and to our families as we lead our homes through the wilderness of this world, preparing for our children for their heavenly home. And so what I'd like for us to do in the next few minutes is to look at these three statements of Scripture that Jesus used in defeating temptation, uh, the temptations of Satan, and see how we might apply them in our families. The first of these uh, is the statement, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, Matthew 4, verse 4. And this is certainly a true statement, but how true is it for our children if we miss or are late for regularly scheduled church services in order to eat a meal or for other activities that are less necessary than eating a meal? Or if every meal is planned, but the spiritual nourishment of the children depends almost exclusively on scraps they can pick up in Bible classes and sermons without any involvement from their parents. Or if recipes, cookbooks, and cooking shows are on the doorpost, lentils, bookshelves, and televisions of our houses, but not God's Word. Or if we have our favorite recipes or pizza delivery phone numbers memorized, but not any scripture. Or we speak of food when we rise up, when we lie down, when we walk by the way, when we sit in our homes, but not of God and his word. What Jesus said is, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so let's make application of that to our families. Jesus also said in defeating the temptations of Satan, you shall not test the Lord your God. Uh, and Paul uh, refers to that same principle in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 9 when he tells the Christians there, we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Complaints against others within the family is dangerously close to complaint against God and should be guarded against. And parents can set the example by dealing with difficulty with a cheerful rather than a complaining spirit. Now let's also think about this statement of Jesus and during his time of testing and temptation. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. In the Paschal home, every once in a while, we get the uncomfortable experience of finding out what it would take to get one or more of our children to disobey us. And sometimes all it takes is a video game, or a teasing sibling, or a suggestion from a friend, or a puppy, or being in public, or an unattended cookie jar, or an ingenious idea that just has to be tried, and all of a sudden parental authority is thrown out the window. It says if you've never given your children any rules or instructions, and if they and it says if they've never read the scripture that clearly says, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That probably doesn't happen in any other homes, but I just wanted to get that off my chest. But there's another child in the Paschal home who I call little Brent, who will sometimes ask, act as if God's authority means nothing. He will act selfishly and pridefully and do what he pleases in spite of all that God may say or do. And I'm afraid I know how his father feels about this kind of behavior. And I need to discipline this child and bring him into subjection. Lest when I preach to my children about parental authority, I myself should be disqualified. The bottom line is that children who put God first 
come from homes where the parents put God first. And so let us use the compass. These three passages that we've talked about are just three of God's commands. But like the compass, they, along with the rest of the commands and principles of Scripture, will give us turn-by-turn -turn guidance, which is exactly what we need. If our desire is to do God's will, and when we do that, we will receive God's best for us. All right. Well, keeping our pilgrim perspective as parents and using the words of Christ from the wilderness to keep them pointing in the right direction will go a long way to our children becoming cheerful pilgrims for the Lord. And so what we need to do is day by day apply the map, use the map, see how God has dealt with his people in the past, and use the compass, the commands and principles of Scripture to make our turn-by-turn -turn decisions for each day. And when we're doing that, we're really just applying in the real world the map and the compass that God has provided in the Scriptures. But I'd like to close with uh, some ideas of activities that can make the pilgrim spirit practical and fun. Uh, and you won't find these in the Scripture. These are just some thoughts that I've had as we've tried to apply some of these uh, principles in, in our family. Uh, engage intentionally in activities that reinforce the pilgrim spirit. One, one example of this would be um, embrace traffic. What better way to remind ourselves and our family that this world is not our home than to be away from our earthly home. The scriptures are full of adventures that God's people had while on the move and so are the memories of many Christian families. Being away from home does place many limitations on the family's normal activities, but at the same time, it opens different perspectives and opportunities that might be unavailable at home. And so whether it's going on a trip or going camping or hiking, these are opportunities to apply this. And uh, since I happen to be in the presence of Brother Smith and uh, being here this weekend reminded me of something he said to me, Probably ten years ago, and I, and I didn't even I didn't until I came here realize that's the same guy that said that that made an impression on me. Um, he may have already said this to you guys, but I, I'm going to mention it because it made an impact on me at the time. He and his family were traveling through Roanoke and were at worship service, and um, it's just so encouraging when Christians who are traveling seek out the people of God and uh, and make their intention and follow through on that purpose to worship with the church wherever they may be. And so that's what I told them. So glad you're here. It's really encouraging that you sought us out. And uh, he shared something with me. He said, you know, there's been times when they've been traveling when, when the boys were, uh, you know, felt reluctant to break whatever they were doing in their vacation to leave and, and go to church. And, and uh, the, what he said to them is, when we're away from home, we're on vacation, do we want God to take a vacation from taking care of us? That's a pretty good way of thinking about it. I'm glad that he said that to me. That's made an impression on me that stuck with me many, many years later. Uh, and that's a perfect example of being on the road. Your children are uh, they have a, what we might call a teachable moment and driving home those spiritual principles um, that will stick with them. Uh, I made the comment to uh, one of the families that was here on this Saturday night with their young kids um, as part of the gospel meeting. I said, you know, I don't think your kids are going to remember much from my lesson, but they are going to remember that mom and dad thought it was important enough to go support a gospel meeting that they packed them up and drove an hour to assemble with the saints to engage in a Bible study. They will remember that lesson. And so as we're, as we're guiding our homes, making decisions in our homes, let's be seeking out those opportunities to put in real life <laughs> the decisions and making those statements and comments that will make it clear to our children what is most important. Uh, Honoring sojourners and pilgrims is another way to reinforce the pilgrim spirit. Just as the Israelites were encouraged to look out for the well-being of sojourners in their society, we can bless and honor those who are traveling through our communities. We're commanded to not to neglect, to show hospitality to strangers. 
For thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2. And so keep traveling Christians or preachers in your home. Or volunteer, uh, find volunteer opportunities to help those who are away from home. Uh, read stories like Pilgrim's Progress or the experiences of those who have proclaimed the gospel in other parts of the world. These are some ways of applying this idea. Uh, another way of in encouraging and reinforcing the pilgrim spirit is accepting guidance. And this would include a range of activities where the family or the children are in a position where they need to follow external guidance in order to succeed. Uh, and so, for example, uh, let one of your children be your GPS unit as you try to go somewhere that they've been often. This could be exciting. Uh, leave plenty of travel time. All right, you're good. Johnny, you're going to tell us when to turn left and when to turn right. You never know where you might end up. Uh, all right, uh, there are activities called geocaching, orienteering, uh, ingress, Pokemon Go, where um, you're using a GPS device. You're not really sure uh, where you're going to find your objectives, but this is a fun activity where, where uh, you and your kids are accepting external guidance, and it's kind of a, a miniature picture of how our whole lives are, where we're depending on God for our heavenly guidance. Or set aside a day for your family to do whatever you think the Lord would most like you to do that day. I wonder what ideas your children might have uh, for how to spend a day with that being the objective. Well, I'm going to end with a couple of case studies from the annals of Paschal history. And the first one is about snakes. Uh, there, this probably was about eight years ago. Uh, we were camping at a primitive camp area in Jefferson National Forest. And uh, before this trip, we had kind of come up with an idea that we thought was pretty good. We had given uh, each of our kids uh, uh, a lanyard with a whistle around their neck, and uh, and so we said, you know, if uh, if you if there's an emergency or you eat mama and daddy, just blow the whistle, and uh, and then we'll know exactly where you are, and we can uh, come and, and make sure we take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. Um, and we had been at this campsite for a period of time, and some of the the girls had gone down to the restroom, which was also fairly primitive. Um, a little ways from the campground, and we heard screams. And so we ran that way, and, uh, and we went to check out to see what was going wrong, and uh, it turned out that, that there was a snake. And uh, this, it was, this was the type of snake it was. It was a ring that snake, and it was about this size, too. This, this isn't a picture of the one that, that my child found, but it was there in the bathroom area, and it was not welcome. And, uh, and that's how we found out when we started hearing the screams. Uh, and, uh, and so we let them know that there was this particular snake was uh, not any danger. And, uh, and so uh, that all, that we also reminded them that, you know, uh, that, that whistle was a better way of letting us know that, we, that they needed our attention than screaming. Uh, and, uh, and so we continued on our camping adventure. Well, I think it was the next day, uh, we... Uh, I think we heard the whistle, and it was coming from about 30 yards from our campsite, and that's where the kids had been jumping on some rocks, and uh, they let us know that they had seen a snake. I mean, maybe you can see a snake, too. This, this is a picture of the scene that we arrived at. Um, I'll zoom in to, uh, to where the snake was. It was actually a, a timber rattler, and, uh, and so uh, it was... Uh, we disposed of the snake, and then we found out later that it was illegal to kill a rattlesnake in the state or in the, in the national forest. And so, don't let anyone know that I did that, please. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, I like that story because I get to be the hero. But the kids need to know that they're snakes, right? Uh, and some snakes are dangerous, and others aren't. But the snakes are going to act according to their nature. Even if you want to be their friend, you have to realize what the nature of the snake is and deal accordingly. And in most circumstances for a child, right, the proper approach to dealing with the snake is to call for help. 
have your father take care of you. Uh, and in the real world, there's a serpent that our kids have to face and deal with. And the proper response to dealing with this serpent is to call for their heavenly father. Uh, and these are the realities of life that we deal with. Well, second case study I'd like to share with you was our trip to the emergency room. A little bit later that same year, we were back at that same campground, and uh, one of the things that we found in the woods not far from our campsite was a great big tree. And uh, you can see my oldest daughter, Sarah. Actually, I should take this opportunity to apologize that my, although I fully intended and was hoping for my wife to be here with all the rest of my kids, when uh, they got back from camp this week, they got word that they had been exposed to COVID. Uh, and so we decided that they would be a little less than welcome here this evening. And so we definitely didn't want to spread any of that possibly. Um, and so that's why they're not here. And I apologize about that. I really do uh, hope and intend uh, to introduce them to you sometime in the near future. I, mean, I just uh, am grateful to have gotten to know you guys. Well, uh, we've got Julia. Um, about eight years ago, they're standing beside me by that uh, large fallen tree, and uh, the kids were having a good time playing on it. Um, and uh, a little while later, Rachel and I were in the camp at the campsite, uh, and we heard screams again. Um, and uh, we ran, although Sarah said she also blew the whistle, so there was both screams and whistle, but guess what we heard? We heard the noise that, uh, you know, kind of made us possibly have a heart attack. That's the noise that that we tuned in on. But anyway, we came over there and Bethany had, had been climbing on the tree and she managed to fall off and hit her head on a rock and was bleeding from her forehead. Uh, and uh, we were in literally the middle of nowhere and didn't know where the closest hospital was. Uh, we punched hospital in the GPS and loaded all the kids in the Van and Bethany was sitting in uh, Rachel's lap, uh, getting pressure to her forehead uh, in the passenger seat while we're driving uh, like this, right, through uh, the mountains of Virginia, heading to an unknown location, following whatever direction the GPS chooses to get us. And I'll just say to you, we were doing a lot of planning, along with uh, looking out for what was coming around the next curve. Um, and uh, we got to the hospital, and, uh, and uh, I guess about five or six stitches later, um, and Bethany was smiling again, and so we're very grateful. Um, and I like that story because, uh, because my Heavenly Father is the hero of that story. Uh, he saw us through that trial. Um, and so this is the message and the lesson that I'd like to share with you. Is that God has given us the map and God has given us the compass. And so let's put those into use daily so we reach His intended destination for us and for our whole family. Our greatest hope and desire as Christian parents is to one day reach our permanent heaven and there be surrounded by those who we love the most in this life, joining in fellowship with God and delighting in Him together. In order to reach that goal, we must have that map. The stories of God's dealings with his people throughout history. Those stories let us know that others have been here before us. And they let us know what to expect on our journey. And we also need the compass, God's commands and principles of the New Testament that tell us which way to turn in our own journey. And when we use the map of the compass for guidance daily and embed them into our lives and the lives of our children, we have the hope of reaching that place that is truly our home. Because this world is not our home. We're just passing through. And we're bringing some little ones along with us. We're bringing as many as our friends and neighbors we can convince to come along. And I hope and pray every one of you will be gathered together with me and my family around our Heavenly Father's throne one day. If you're not on that journey, if you're not headed that direction, you need to turn around and head in the right direction. Turn yourself towards heaven. And as we 
think about that, we realize that God has given his own son to make it possible for us to reach that destination. We said earlier in this series of lessons that you know, we're pointed towards heaven, but we turn off. The only way to get back on course is to make another turn. And if you're looking at your life and you're not headed to heaven, the only way to head that way is to make a turn. And it, it is time for you to make a turn tonight. We want to offer that opportunity to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Jesus Christ, and be baptized to have all of your sins washed away. Uh, or if, you're, if you're a Christian that's turned off the path, get back on the straight and narrow road. Start using that GPS guidance that your Heavenly Father gave you to make sure that you get home. Because I guarantee your Heavenly Father is looking out the door, just like the picture of the parable of the prodigal son, eager for every single one of us to make it all the way home. Uh, and so let's do our part to get there. If we can help you in any way, come forward as we stand and sing. <laughs>